All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to Clay Art Center. Um, my name is Jacqueline Eckersley. I'm hosting for the first time. Um, I'm the development assistant at Clay Art Center, um, and we are very excited to have Lauren Sandler um, with us today. Um, Lauren holds an MFA in ceramics from Penn State University and undergraduate degrees in anthropology and ceramics from Ithaca College and SUNY New Paltz. Um, she is an assistant professor and program head of ceramics at Tyler School of Art and Architecture and currently serves on the board of the National Council of Education for the Ceramic Arts as director at large. Um, and please be sure to check out Lauren's work in our online shop. That's clayartcenter.org forward slash shop. The full proceed of uh, the sale of all of Lauren's work uh, go to help support the local Port Chester community. Uh, Lauren is donating her proceeds to the Sustainable Port Chester Alliance and Clay Art Center is donating to the Port Chester Rye NAACP. So again, please check out her work at our shop. That's clayartcenter.org forward slash shop. Um, and before I hand things over to Lauren, I'm just going to give you a little information about Clay Art Center, who we are and, and what we do um, to those of you who are new to us today. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and share this. Um, so we are located in Port Chester, uh, Port Chester, New York. It's 20 miles north of New York City in Westchester County. Uh, so that means you can't uh, take a subway to us, um, but you could take a train. Um, we are a nationally recognized nonprofit ceramic arts organization, and we offer a studio rental and education for all levels, adults, kids, um, artists in residence programs, exhibitions, a shop, as well as a robust community of artists. One minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to our main event, Lauren. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. I assume you all can see that. If not, someone will let me know. Um, but thanks, Jacqueline, and, and thanks everyone for um, just taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my work, but also really more broadly about how I think about um, the material of clay and how I approach that, both as an artist and as an educator. And as Jacqueline said at the end, there'll definitely be some time to ask questions and hope, hopefully we can have a bit more of a, or just a conversation. And so I um, came to ceramics, um, as was just noted, through um, studying anthropology in college. And it was really through ceramics as a remnant and as an artifact that brought me to think about the material. And that still very much impacts my work today as an artist. Um, and how I think about clay. And, and so clay is, it's archival. It's, it's a record of a time and a place. And, and that's true for past or historic objects. But I also think about the objects that we make today as essentially cultural signifiers of the time and place in which we, we live. And so clay, for me, is really first and foremost a cultural material. You know, every culture in the world has a relationship to this material. Um, and clay is a material that it, it, it permeates our lives. Uh, you know, it is, it is historic and contemporary. Um, something that I'll often say is, you know, it's the material that are in cuneiform tablets. It's the material that are in biomedical implants, as that image on the left there shows. It's in the tiles on the space shuttle. It's in the bricks that enslaved people used to build the White House. That's one of those bricks is there in that center image. Um, it's the earth that we grow our food in and it's the cup that is often on, you know, most of our kitchen tables. And, and so it is a material that surrounds us. Um, and clay has memory. You know, it, it remembers. Those of us who work with the material know that as far as its, its physical properties and working with the material, but it also has uh, a memory of time as, as an archival material, and it tells stories, and it moves through histories and geographies. And I think about that ubiquity of the material, I think that through that ubiquity, it has the potential to evoke um, 
you know, the social and the political, domestic space and public place and the private and shared. And, and how this expansiveness of the material I think is most apparent when, when we see the hands that, that have worked it and we hear the voices and we really understand the abundance of narratives that exist in this material. And so I'm also an educator and I think a lot about how we teach um, clay. And I'm thinking uh, more within spaces of academia because that's more often the spaces in which I'm teaching in. And, and often ceramics, I think, is taught by normalizing um, a canon of knowledge, you know, but that, that canon is, is very specific with a Eurocentric bias and this um, sort of fascination with, with East Asia. And, and it features really um, specific methodologies and aesthetics, and there's so much there that is really fascinating and, and compelling and so much to, to explore and dive into, but when that is presented as um, the canon, it, ef it effectively erases and it, and it doesn't discuss the majority of people who have and who continue to work with, with clay. And, and there are many um, cultural contexts and, and ways of teaching and learning and making art and many systems and knowledge bases through which one can learn. And so I think about my job both as an artist and an educator is to in some ways to kind of borrow a word from ceramics is really kind of to decenter or or even disrupt the mechanisms that maintain these limited narratives and 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 keep these canonized mythologies in place and so some questions that i will often ask are who's in the clay um, and who tells the stories and what stories are untold um, how are narratives written in the material and, and what are the ways through which these stories manifest? And so within my own work, I'm often using um, allegoric containers, uh, mundane assemblages, sometimes fragmented forms to try to deconstruct mythologies and explain stories that have been um, erased or ignored. Um, so this is a, an image of, um, a painting by Clara Peters. Um, she was a Flemish painter uh, from the early, well, from the 1600s, and one of the few known women painters of the time. And so, when I look at at this painting, I'm really interested in the many stories that are held within this image. So there's the story of the painter herself, as well as um, the history of still life painting as a genre and how women were more likely to pursue this type of painting as opposed to um, depicting imagery that would require knowledge of anatomy, which would be um, difficult for a woman to acquire at the time. Um, but in this painting is also the history of how objects migrated around the globe through trade and colonialism. That um, dish in the bottom right, that blue and white dish in the bottom right image, you see here the, the Chinese porcelains that were brought from China to Europe. This one probably from the Dutch East India Company. And so we have this time uh, in the 1600s, how the, the, the Dutch launched into this trading around the world, um, whether it's West Africa for slaves, salt in Venezuela, silks in Persia, and the Dutch overtook Asian trade from the Portuguese, which is where we start to be, we begin to see this enormous acquiring and spreading of Chinese porcelains into a European market, followed by the, the mimicry, and then we see the Delft ware in this part of Europe and so on. And so these, these stories and histories are embedded in the ceramic objects. And I'm really interested in the multiple narratives and histories that exist, for example, in this image. And that's often how I'll approach looking at work and making and teaching, you know, questioning these larger narratives at play that are both seen and unseen. So um, a number of years ago, my work shifted from um, more abstract works to more representations of, of, of realistic objects as I turn my focus to, to looking um, and thinking a lot more about domestic objects. And, I'd always loved still life paintings um, for the representation of domestic spaces and objects, but also the allegorical symbolism within them. And so this series um, called Recollections is 
was really my beginning of, of working with still lives in some capacity. And so conceptually, I was interested in evoking these parallels between still life as a as painting, as a historic painting genre to, to ceramic arts through these shared themes of both um, everyday representation, but also this marginalized critical reception, still lives within the historic you know, historic painting genres and ceramics within within the arts. And and for me, both in some in part possess this kind of quietness and touch on the brevity and impermanence of life, often in prosaic forms in these mundane environments. And the series also began as a recollection of um, my mother's absence through the objects of her bathroom vanity. And they're really tableaus that are reflective of a life that's not there or these narratives left by an absence. And in this series, I was also just thinking about objects that were precious to me, whether my mother's perfume bottle, my grandmother's glasses that I have, but how these objects um, often carry a familial and cultural histories. And, and I think of these objects as relics that hold memory or vestiges of ideas. And I'm interested in that often marginal or peripheral objects in our lives and, and in the unseen of these objects or in the overlooked of these objects lies really the evidence of our lives. Um, so this is from um, a series that followed the recollections, it's called Overlooked. And, um, and in this, I was continuing to think about overlooked, but no more as it relates to people, I mean, the ill, elderly, um, people without power, those who are isolated and unseen. And so through classical forms and styles, and I use that term classical really to convey a certain perceived status or, or hierarchy of objects, whether it's terrines, as in this piece, or different types of utensils or, or the still life, to try to um, kind of demythologize the status of those objects. And so this body of work is also looking to sort of question issues of capacity and worth through the use of domestic objects and tools and detritus. And so this piece um, stone soup spoon theory. It it's, um, tells the story of a, a soup, essentially, of interdependence in which we all have nourishment to offer. And so in this, I'm combining um, the fable stone soup, which I'm sure a lot of you are know of. Um, and in that fable, um, uh, each villager contributes to a meal that started from a magical stone with spoon theory, which is a term that um, some people with disabilities use. And it, it refers to how people sometimes feel when, if you just have a few sp limited number of spoons to get through your day, how do you do that? So if I only have sp five spoons and it requires me a spoon to get out of bed, a spoon to brush my teeth, a spoon to make breakfast, so I'm quickly left without spoons and how am I to get through my day? And so I think of this as really an opportunity of those of us with more spoons, whether that means um, one's physical capabilities or access to resources to offer those. And so for, in this, the, the terrain is, it represents a body and often in my work, the, the vessel is a stand-in for the body, whether it's an individual body or collective body, um, governing bodies, bodies of evidence, bodies of land and so on. Um, and this piece is, thinking of this object as an object that both um, offers and receives nourishment. Um, and so within this series, I was uh, still working with this um, still life framework and, and thinking about ways to, to examine this place of isolation in juxtaposition to an external world and, and thinking about ideas of containment and restrictions of movement through interior tableaus. This piece, Cactus Tea, is part of a group of windowsill tableaus of someone who lives most of their life inside looking out. And I was thinking about um, the gaze of someone looking out and not being seen by the outside world and, and questioning really who occupies that gaze and its control and authority and who remains subject to it, who is seen and, and who is not seen really within that. Um, and what are the objects that might exist on this windowsill? 
And so I'm playing with the value of these objects that might be considered garbage or um, detritus and, and pre presenting with them with new worth and meaning. So there's a, a sardine can with spools, a um, matchbox with razors, a teacup that is now growing a cactus out of it. Um, so uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> I had this, um, an opportunity, I did a residency at a, uh, a center for people with disabilities. And it was a, a multidisciplinary center or program really that, that nurtured a, a collaborative and creative inquiry among people with disabilities and students and artists and the larger community and area residents. And the art, artist residency was um, is part of the center's maker's lab is where it took place. And, and, and it was a, a place that really focused on accessibility and collaboration through integrating heritage crafts and, and new technologies. And so every day there was a, um, a rail trail behind the maker's lab and I would go and I'd walk along the rail trail and I was thinking a lot about access and movement um, in part because I was working in a place whose focus was about providing access but also on my walk, I would reflect on my partner who lives much of her life indoors due to disability and chronic illness. And I was thinking about her movements and the boundaries of those movements and, and asking myself how I could potentially translate the landscape of the walk to her and to others who live within constrained environments. And so I began by, um, by using small torn bits of clay and it, essentially initially just um, laying them down like a landscape or really like a, the topography of my walk. Um, but then I began to, to fold the horizontal land into, um, or of this process really into a vert in the vertical contours of containers. And these are the pieces that just came out of that process. And I call them corn, uh, torn geographies. And I show these as an assemblage to convey both the individual and, and, and the community. Um, and, and some of these pieces, as Jacqueline noted in the beginning, um, are, are, are on the website. Um, and I think, you know, many of us right now are, are um, I think, looking for ways to support communities that, that we are a part of. And, and so, as she mentioned, the, all the proceeds for this work that are on the website are going to both the Sustainable Port Chester Alliance and the Clay Art Center is donating all of their proceeds from the sale of my work to the Port Chester Rye NAACP. So hopefully you can take a look at those after the talk. I think there's some just great um, organizations local to the Clay Art Center that we're looking to support. Um, so while I was doing this residency, um, my family's home caught fire and burnt down. Um, completely, and and I and I lost very suddenly this tangible, physical space that held decades of living and memories and stories. And so, at the time, I was working on those torn geography pieces, and I was thinking about our boundaries or borders of movements or our physical space. And and this fire um, caused uh, this complete dismantling of the physical space. Um, this is a, a video of the actual fire that was um, taken and posted on Facebook while this was happening. And so um, a couple of days later, I went, um, after the fire, I went to see what was left of the house and um, standing there in the, in the midst of this debris on the, it was this quiet um, gray morning, um, and just the sound of a bird chirping. Um, I just, I felt compelled to try to create something tangible from this. And so um, I, took the, uh, I took these two videos and I took the audio from these two videos of the fire and the bird and, and transferred and just essentially transferred those audio files to the visual sound waves of them. The, the fire is on top and the sound of the bird is on the bottom here. And then I, um, I hand built ceramic tiles that were really touched and pinched. Um, I fired them in an outdoor pit firing. I essentially, I dug a hole in the earth. I put the tiles in, I filled it with a bunch of combustible material and I just set it on fire and let it slowly burn over the course of the day. And afterwards, um, 
I, I laser cut these sound waves onto the tiles. And this is the final piece. It's, it's the six tiles that you see on top. The bottom is just a, it's one of those. It's a detail of one of the file of the tiles. It's called bird's eye view. And so collectively these tiles, I think, appear with this sort of emblazoned landscape. Um, and the, that depth of surface is really just achieved through this, the layers of the ash and the carbon and the combustible material um, that create this kind of space and movement. Um, so that in the end, these objects have that mark of my hand, you know, with the mark of the fire and then the mark of the machine of the laser cutter to, to lay down that image. Um, and now the piece now, um, is, resides on the wall of the new home that we have since rebuilt after the fire. Um, so through um, the study of ceramics and, and, and the elements in our clay, um, we unearth stories, whether it's personal stories, um, political stories, stories of community, um, stories of material, of techno technological change. And clay as an archival material, it remembers and it informs and speaks to those of us not always in the room. And I think about how clay really provides a depth and and information if we listen and um, we look and we investigate. And so what if the Chronicle of Clay were told from the perspective of a brick or of cobalt with the transparency from the earth to our table or our studios? And so I think about this larger context of the objects that I make, but also the histories I reference in my work and, and, and the materials that we use as artists. So this is an image of, um, a, of a cobalt mine and so cobalt is a distinctive colorant that we use in ceramics. You know, it appears in the blue and white ware um, that moved throughout Asia, the Middle East, and into Europe and around the globe. And the journey of this material really um, chronicles a global trade and a historic and contemporary migrations, old and new imperialisms, and, and corporate policy and power. So the components in our materials and in, in ceramics contain um, political and personal consequences and content and context. So today, the largest producer of cobalt, um, which is about 60%, comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You know, this is a country that has enormous wealth of natural resources, but people live um, in great poverty. And so cobalt is in our ceramics, it's in our pigments, it's in the batteries that are in our phone, in our computers, in our cars and military equipment and drones. And so multinational mining companies um, accumulate tremendous profits through the exploitation of, of individuals and communities and resources to extract cobalt for our products and our glazes and our pigments. And so I think about how as artists, we utilize this material and the labor and the lives used to extract and process it. And so thinking about the expansiveness of clay and the breadth and depth of clay, I often ask, you know, who is in our clay and, and what narratives are being told and who constructs those narratives? What myths are perpetuated in our clay? Um, this is a piece, um, what if the dandelion told the story of tea? And, it, and in this series, I was thinking of the vessel as a body, um, really as a site of historic resistance. Um, so through this series of using different historic ceramic vessels to depict places of impact and power struggles and how systems of control distribute dominant narratives to perpetuate authority. So in this piece, I was thinking of ways to upend classical and traditional tropes and, and I use those terms classical and traditional as defined by canons of Eurocentric art and art history to call into question the historic definitions of those two terms. And so instead of representing um, classically shaped teacups as occupiers of status and, and a traditionally, traditionally built coil pot um, as something that is static and unchanging, as I was building this, I was really thinking of the teacups as parasitic and, and trying to overtake this formidable water bowl, its walls 
bisecting the teacups. As you can see here, the teacups are in and out of the entire piece. And so um, this piece is also chronicling this com these competing narratives in the global history of tea. Um, and question, what is myth and what is fact? So through colonization, through trade wars, forced mass migrations, imperial powers exploited resources such as tea, um, commodifying it. And so when the narrative is told from the perspective of the colonizer, multiple truths are erased. For example, the dandelion is not a worthless weed, but the beneficial sucker in dandelion tea. And so I use this symbolic work to really highlight history's distortions so that the dandelion, not the teacup, tells the story. So in working with this material, both in my studio practice, but also in the classroom, um, I continually stress the significance of context along with our content. A brick is never just a brick. You know, clay as material object contains, as I said, this enormous global, political, social, and economic content and context. Um, and, and for me, this is what makes clay such a compelling and fascinating material to work with as, as an artist. So the clay brick is all around us. It's in our kilns, it's in architecture, it's in artwork, but a brick is never really just a brick. You know, to discuss bricks today, we can't ignore the global brick production in India and China with this unregulated industry of bonded laborers. And so this image is of a kiln in China, um, and China is the world's largest producer of bricks. And you can see on the bottom right there, two laborers washing themselves inside the kiln. Um, and these two images <clears throat> also represent this um, contemporary cultural context of bricks. The image on the right um, are bricks that were made from recycled rubble and coal dust of destroyed buildings in Gaza. Um, and they're called uh, green cake and were, they were created by two women engineering graduates from the Islamic University of Gaza. And so they're literally using the rubble of destruction um, and oppression to create anew. And the image on the left is in Freedmanstown in Houston. <clears throat> and it is the remains of a Yoruba patterned road um, that was laid by uh, formerly enslaved people when this city refused the request to pave the streets. And these roads have been pulled up or paved over, but after protest um, from residents, some of the bricks in recent years have been relayed. So I show these images really to convey how we look at our materials and our tools and our processes. And, and I think of ceramics really as, a, as really a site of, in a place of both resilience and resistance of criticism and commentary. And I think about the, this material that so many of us work with holds this global history and contemporary presence and creates this capability for us to make objects that really are loaded with both, you know, sweeping, but also really specific subjects and themes and transformative actions. Um, so I'll talk a bit about my current series of work, which is called Centeripe series. Um, so I'm thinking about in this series of work, this idea of cultural content, um, in historic context through deconstructing myths using both personal and historic narratives. So this series is informed by these lidded lacanus pots of century based Sicily. This is, an, this is an example of one of them here. And so they were produced from 300 to 200 BC um, in a region in Sicily where my mother's family is from. And we still have relatives who live in that area. And so part of the research of this work actually began with conversations with students about appropriation in ceramics and talking about thinking about the ways that we um, as artists, what we look at as artists, you know, what our work references, how our personal relationships with those reference objects impact the content of our work how certain power dynamics are established dependent upon who I am and what the referenced work is. And so this led me to do some more research on objects from my own cultural lineage, which is Jewish and Italian. And so through that, I came upon these objects. And initially what, what brought my attention to them was, I felt like they had a certain visual awkwardness that I was really drawn to. And I think that is in part because the foot 
body lid and finial of these are um, um, they're they're just they're stacked they're not attached and I thought that that creates a certain oddness of form that I really loved um, I had never seen these before finding them in this research they're also as I mentioned where my family my mother's family is from so I was really drawn to them for multiple reasons um, this gives you a sense of what the surface looked more like they were brightly colored polychromatic um, colored with, with with tempera paint, um, often decorative elements as, I'll just go back to that, that kind of a midsection with that, it's like a Medusa head, would just be on one side. So it was kind of creating a facade, um, like a, a building. Um, but also this, the surface work um, reference, frescoes of the time period, they would often be images of myths, um, such as Dionysus, images of women often conducting mystic rites. And so um, I wanted to examine my own familial histories and cultures to, in order to find ways to discuss different historic narratives and power relationships. So as I began to research the works from ancient Rome, I found that it really amplified this multiculturalism of the era and refute this lie that class, classical antiquity was a homogenous time and place. And um, so this led to further consideration of objects from antiquity, particularly these figurative marble statues that were presented as white, as, the, as we see on the left there, and that's a, a, a remaking of what it more accurately likely looked like. And so when these objects, as we know now, um, and statues of antiquity were, antiquity were depicted in the Renaissance era, they were presented as monochromatic when they were in fact polychromatic and color and inlay and gilding and, and so on. And so this constructed mythology of these sculptures as white was established and proliferated in the 18th and 19th centuries as a way to equate racial whiteness with beauty. But the reality of ancient Rome, Rome was you could be Roman and be Judean or Ethiopian or Nubian um, Syrian and so on. Um, this is a, a fresco from Pompeii, Italy, uh, a, a bit later than the, the century pay pieces. But you know, ancient Rome did not construct the difference through this language of of race and biology and skin color as we do now. So this belief that ancient Greeks and Romans are this foundation of a white and Western civilization that belongs to white people is this false. Um, is, is false and is part of this um, misrepresentation of histories. And so this false representation of antiquity and the classics has been perpetuated in our classrooms and in our museums through disciplines of art and art history. And this is a Sicilian tombstone um, that I've always really loved. I think it really shows this, um, well, the history of Sicily in many ways and also this multi-ethnic um, and um, antiquities, particularly of Sicily, where we have um, um, Latin on the left, Greek on the right, Hebrew on top, and Arabic on the bottom. And so I'll, I'll show you a few pieces here from of mine from this series. And so this, this series is in part critiquing this Eurocentric art history that is found on these narratives misappropriating earlier histories. But I also think of these objects as embodying these migrations and diasporas of of myths and reality, of both domesticity and ritual, talking about trade and commodity and function and adornment. Um, and each piece um, is covered or has these repeated objects attached to the form to create a vessel that really evokes this embodiment of my, of, of my own familial cultures and exploring different perspectives and forces and ideologies coming together. So this piece focusing on salt, those are um, salt shakers kind of in that upper area of the object there. So referencing salt, a commodity um, in ancient times as trade and currency, a material that moves through different landscapes and cultures. It is a source of power and of protest, of technological advances through preservation and a healing agent. And this piece, the, the objects that are depicted on this um, are all um, 
images that were inscribed on these ancient ceramic Jewish oil lamps that I was looking at. And you can see the oil lamps, oil, these oil lamps um, on the two kind of on the top and the bottom of this piece. Um, and so on this, there's the oil lamps, um, the hanging bits are pomegranate seeds, there's combs that were used for fibers, barley and wheat, cheese, and so on. And all of these pieces are lidded containers. They function, they have a functioning lid. Because the, the original objects I was looking at were had these lids, and I and I wanted to keep that element in these. Um, and this piece, uh, flax and spindles. Um, so on this, there's um, flax, the, the, the flower of flax, weaving spindles that created textiles, barley seeds, so a variety of crops that were taxed and controlled and sold in Roman colonies, that, and these were also staples among ancient Jews. And, and this piece, I think, is a bit more, I think I was trying, I think it's a bit more visually awkward. I think that the shape of this, the handles, and thinking of ways to maybe convey some of that awkwardness of the original objects that I was particularly drawn to. And then here, uh, weights and bobbers. So this piece is thinking more about this representation or representing sea movement of goods of people. Um, and so on this, um, there's hooks and weights and bobbers and rope and, and thinking about um, movement and migration and, and diaspora, really. And so um, I think that the work that we do as artists, but also as educators, uh, or I think the work that I do as an artist, as an, educa an educator, is really about unpacking truths um, and deconstructing mythologies and, and narratives that are used often to uphold um, systems and structures that maintain authority and, and how to bring attention to history and a context of struggle, of oppression and of justice. And I think of um, the suffering that we're, so many are experiencing and we are all wit witnessing now with the pandemic is due really more to a response and this ongoing constructed retelling of events to suit the needs of inadequacy, of greed and of power. And I also think the role of art is also to provide hope and possibility and to create community and I think that we've also seen that, or we are seeing that through the, the pandemic and the protest, I think through collaborative efforts of mutual aid um, and the ways that accessibility has become more, um, uh, is just becoming, is it more at the forefront via virtual sharing and engagement, um, accommodations that people and places are making to share content, to have a, a, a more collective participation from people who would not be able to physically participate. And so I'm, I hope that this continues and um, becomes really a philosophical and structural part of, of the organizations and the institutions that um, are a part of our lives and that we all move through. Thank you.